Welcome to episode four of Mental Mastery, where I interview the world's greatest minds on what it takes to live a happy and successful life. On today's show, I'm joined by Bob Tedi, Director of Leadership Development and Crew, and author of the popular leadership development blog, leadingwithquestions.com, which is followed by leaders in over 100 nations. He's also author of the ebook, Great Leaders Ask Questions, a Fortune 100 list, and you can download that for free at leadingwithquestions.com. So Bob, thank you so much for being on the show. Max, it is my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. It's really amazing. So, Bob, when you talk about leading with questions, what do you mean by that? Well, Max, uh, for me, every time you ask a question, there's going to be a story. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and, great. That's fantastic. And um, for many years, I was what I now call a benevolent dictator. <laughs> I love my staff. I appreciated their work. I expressed uh, appreciation for, you know, work well done and effort. But I thought the job of a leader was to lead, i.e. to be directive, to tell people, their staff what to do. I mean, tell them kindly, but nevertheless, the job of the leader is to set the direction and give orders, but politely on what to do. And in 2006, uh, I was in a, a bookstore. My wife loves to go to bookstores. She goes all over the bookstore, but she knows when she's ready to go, she can always find me in the leadership section. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that day, I found the book called Leading with Questions by Dr. Michael Marquardt. And perusing a few pages, I said, hey, this one's a keeper, and I took it home. And it was a, tur a page turner for me. And as I read that book, I saw there was a new way to lead that I'd never considered. And that new way was to lead with questions. I share kind of this silly illustration, but I'll ask you, Max, if you were in a rowboat with your whole team and, uh, and everybody had an oar and your goal was to get to the other side of the lake as fast as possible, how many of them would you like to have row with you? Well, all of them, ideally. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I've never had a leader uh, answer that question otherwise. But I then follow with, why then would you want to row into the future of your organization and, and have all your staff present but you're the only one with an oar in the water. Why would you not want to access all of the brain power on your team by asking them just a simple question? How do you think we could get across the lake faster? Yeah. Or how could, do you think we might be able to reach this goal uh, faster, better, uh, you know, quicker, more excellence? You, you can change the what do you think about. You can change that. And as a leader does that, now you're accessing all the horsepower. And, and then Max, uh, again, I ask a lot of <laughs> simple questions too. If, um, if you were on my team, and, and I'm gonna give you two, two A and B. If you're on my team and I say, well, Max, here's what I want you to do. In other words, I'm the directive leader and I tell you what I want you to do in order for us to get to the future faster. I'm like, not again. <laughs> yeah, I could do it that way. Or if I said, Max, what do you think we might do to be able to accelerate our growth? Which one of those two is going to be more motivational to you? Well, definitely the second one where you ask me actually what, I, what my views are, how I can yeah. put myself out there. And, and Max, when that leader accesses the brain power of everybody around the table, they may hear things and say, oh, my goodness. Wow, Max, I never thought of that. That's brilliant. Let's do it. Now, Max, how motivated are you going to be to execute on your idea versus the leader's idea? Oh, a thousand times more, right? Because you yeah. own it and you think it's your kind of brainchild. So you want to take action. You want to actually take over a leadership position in that and actually make stuff happen. So, yeah. And let me also say to leaders, though, as you ask that question, you do you're not um, you don't have to say yes to every idea you hear. You still can determine that. But as you sit and listen, you actually are going to hear many ideas. That you're going to say, wow, I hadn't thought of that. That would really add horsepower. But now the whole team's involved. Now, Max answered 
And now, you know, involvement breeds commitment. And as Max gave input, and, uh, and, and let's just say the team forms it, it's more synergy, but all of them can kind of see their fingerprints on the plan now, that where they contribute it, where they help shape it. Well, that team is now gonna go somewhere. So Max, I, I trust I've answered the question. On oh, for sure, and I really love this, to look at it, like looking at like you catalyzing kind of the brain power, how, horsepower as you call it, really using everyone's brains to come up with the, with the best answer. And so one, one thing I would like to add to that is for, for some of the listeners here that may be thinking, well, I don't have like a formal leadership position. Like I'm not a formal leader. I think one of the things we all have to realize is that we're all leaders, right? Whether you're a stay-at-home mom, you're an athlete, you're a street sweeper, like anyone that interacts with other people, whether it's your family members, your friends, your coworkers, we all have the opportunity to lead and to, yeah. to affect change, to affect the way other people think about their lives and about their goals. So um, even if like you live in a dark cave at the end of the world, like you're still leading yourself, right? And really want to dive into like personal leadership later as well. But that, that's just one point. Like leadership, I think, is for everyone. And so there was this concept of leading with questions really is a paradigm change. It, what you just said there, Max, reminds me of a, a quote from my friend, uh, Andrew Sobel. And, and Andrew says, telling creates resistance. Asking creates relationship. Yeah. And so even when, you know, you say, well, I'm not really a leader, but just as you interact with other people, when you ask them, please tell me your story. When you ask them, what do you think we should do? Um, and you're asking questions, you're building relationships. For sure, for sure. And I think also one of the powerful things about it is it kind of direct, direct focus and attention, right? It, it uh, changes our attention to a different way of looking at things. So all of a sudden, you can go from negative to positive just because of a question, how you frame it. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is really powerful, I think. So... You've said that the biggest shift in your leadership skills has come from asking questions. So why are questions so powerful? Aside from just uh, getting brain power, why yeah. is it so powerful to kind of well, get people to? Yes, it's, um, there's, I love quotes. <laughs> and, um, and I don't have this one right in front of me, but uh, another of my friends says that when you tell, the other person's brain can be asleep. Mm -hmm. But when you ask, the other person's brain wakes up and comes alive. And, wow. uh, and, and Max, I always say, have you learned the art, Max, of looking like you're paying attention when somebody is talking, 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 when in fact your mind is actually oh, yeah. awake? <laughs> I think we all have, right? <laughs> yeah, we all have. But the moment someone says, Max, can I ask you a question? If you've been thinking a thousand miles away, where does your attention come to? All of a sudden comes right back in the present right. moment. So if you want to own someone's brain or at least use it for a while, you say, Max, can I ask you a question? Yes. And then you ask your question and that person's brain now is processing. Do they understand the question? How will they answer the question? And then even when they start giving you the answer, if, if they're face to face with you, they're reading your facial response to see, do you understand? Are you pleased with the answer? Are you confused? Uh, are you mad? Uh, whatever that is, they'll begin to edit what they're saying in the answer, even as they're sharing it. And, and the fact is, for the time to ask and answer, you are making 100% use of their brain. Yeah, that's true. You're kind of boring on their brain power, right? Getting new yeah. ideas and insights. And so that's why I think questions are, are so powerful versus being a, a teller, teller, teller. <laughs> <laughs> so who are some leaders in your own life that have exemplified this for you? Wow. Well... There's a, a guy named Bob Beal, and Bob Beal, president of Master Planning International, has been my mentor since 1980. Oh, wow. And uh, Bob was the first one that ever pointed out to me the, the value of questions. Back in 1980, uh, shortly after I'd met him, he one day said, you know, Bob, I have a, a hobby. I, I collect uh, things. 
He said, can you guess what I might uh, have a hobby collecting? Well, Max, I kind of thought of what are the kind of traditional things people collect? I well, said coins. Cars or coins or <laughs> stamps, baseball cards yeah. in the U.S. Um, and he just smiled. And then he said, Bob, I collect questions. Wow. And I know I looked rather puzzled, like questions. Yeah, what do you mean? Like <laughs> yeah, what do you mean? And uh, he began to share the value of, of questions. Uh, again, I don't have this quote right in front of me. Oh, that's fine. But, but he said, you know, questions are like the golden keys that unlock the mind. And as somebody asks you a great question, it, you know, sometimes it only unlocks obvious. But when somebody asks you a great, thoughtful question, it actually unlocks things in you. As you begin to answer, it's even a new answer to you. Yeah. It gives you insight. And, um, and so Bob shared that he has this collection of questions. And he said the wonderful thing about collecting a question is, you know, he can get them from anyone, but you can share them and you still have them. If, if I share a coin that I have with you, either you have it or I have it, but we don't both have it. But when you share a question that's a great question, we still both have it. That's right. Kind of multiply us to everyone. Yes. Uh, but that kind of stayed asleep in me. It was like, okay, that's valuable. And in 2006, when I discovered Michael Marquardt's book, and, um, and Mike has now become a friend, and, um, and then, you know, becoming more conscious of questions, I... I think as I interact with, with friends, uh, other leaders, and they ask me a great question, it's like, wow, wait a minute, Max. Yeah, let, let me get out my notebook, right? Question down, because I want to use it. Mm -hmm. that, that's wow. amazing. I love that. And Max, let me go just briefly another direction here. Um, you know, sometimes as I travel and speak on this topic, I, I encounter people who uh, kind of reading them, it's kind of like, yeah, they would like to learn to lead with questions, but they kind of imagine to do that successfully, they need to go get a master's in questionology. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's kind of like uh, becoming a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon. It'd be nice, but it probably won't happen. Yeah. And so I love to share with them that I can uh, teach anyone to lead with questions in 30 seconds. Wow. So what does that look like? Well, would you like to learn to lead with questions in 30 seconds? Oh, of course. <laughs> Max, and, and I say this usually when I'm speaking to an audience, I'll ask for a volunteer and they come up and, um, and I'll say the same to you, Max. I believe that you have such incredible memory that you'll only have to hear my four favorite questions once and you'll have them memorized. All right, let's see. <laughs> so here's the four favorite questions. The first one, Max, is what do you think about? And you'd fill in the blank. The second one is what else? The third one is what else? The fourth one is what else? Wow. <laughs> Max, do you have a memorized? <laughs> For sure. So the first one is, what do you think about X? What else? What else? And what else? Yeah. <laughs> Love now, that. People hearing that for the first time could think, well, that that's kind of can't work. But in a conversation where when you say, hey, Max, what do you think we might do to increase revenue or improve advertising? And you start answering. And I say, wow what else? And, and you give them more of an answer. And, and, you know, I could change it up and say, Max, man, I'm taking notes. Keep talking. What, what else? Way to go boost someone's ego, right? Like yes. many of us, when we're asked a question, kind of our first answer is, is we do this subconsciously, but to protect ourselves, we roll out what I would call a safe answer and we see how it's treated. So if somebody says, well, Bob, what do you think about? And I give an answer and they say, well, that's dumb. Everyone knows that. Well, I'm glad I didn't say anything else. <laughs> They've true. now shut me off. But if they say, wow, wow, what, what else? I've found that by the time you ask the what else the third, fourth time, you actually get to their gold nugget mm -hmm. because now they're completely relaxed and they're thinking you must think that they're smart. Yeah. And you get their very best stuff. 
And for a leader or any one of your listeners today who says, I'd like to learn to lead with questions, if they'll start there, it's really that simple. Now, there's some more questions, you know, I can share. And, and like you've uh, mentioned my book, Great Leaders Ask Questions. It's free ebook on my uh, blog, leadingwithquestions.com. It shares over 100 Fortune 100 questions that you can use to lead with questions. Yeah, and by the way, I got to chip in there real quickly. Those questions are absolutely amazing. I, I read the thing in one setting. Like, it was just so much insights, really. And so this this uh, concept of really the leading in 30 seconds, it really reminded me of the five whys that you talk about. So can you share with us what that is? I'm sorry, what? Well, can you share with us what the concept of the five whys is? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, on one hand, Max, let me just preface it. Some people will say that uh, asking why is not always a good question. And, and I like to distinguish asking a person, in other words, where you focus on a person and like, Max, why did you do that? <laughs> Usually creates a defensiveness. And what I find better is to ask what or how instead of why, instead of why did you do that, Max? Max, what led you to that uh, decision? And um, so when you're talking about a per with a person and the subject of your why is a person, then I find it's best to use what or how. But if you're talking about a situation, in other words, not an individual, but a situation, and I think it was actually Toyota that came up with this concept of asking why five times. So you have a problem. You say, why is that problem happening? And you get an answer. And you say, okay, what? why is that happening? And you get another answer. And you ask why five times to get to the real problem. And in my book, uh, there's a, a true story happened in Washington, D.C. The uh, Jefferson Monument that honors uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, they said there were birds pooping all over the monument. So it was like, why is that happening? And so um, they did some research and discovered, well, the birds that were pooping all over it were attracted to the monument because of uh, little midges that they ate. <laughs> and so they said, well, why are there so many midges here? Well, they discovered that the midges, they were turning the lights on at the monument one hour before dark, and somehow that created the right um mood lighting for midge sex so, <laughs> wow. you know uh, just going in abundance there and so the food source was there the birds came they ate the midges they, they pooped know. on the monument so they made a decision to delay turning on the lights until absolute dark and the midges quit uh quit congregating there the birds no longer were attracted and uh and bird poop all over the monument quit because they'd ask why, why, why to figure out what the real problem was. So when it comes to uh, not people, but situations, projects, whatever that aren't working, asking the why five times can help you get to what is the real problem and solve that one. And, and again, like dominoes, the other things are solved. Well, I really love that. So one other thing that you share in your book, another question is that before you jump into a problem, before you discuss like all the, the obstacles in the way, what you have to do, ask what's going right. So what's uh, a, what's, why is that so powerful? Well, th thank you again. Um, a number of years ago, I, I heard from a, a consultant, and in this case, he was a male. There, there's many wonderful female consultants. But he shared that he made a handsome six-figure income just asking four questions. And, uh, and Max, these four questions are so simple that you'll have them memorized by hearing <laughs> them once. Okay. But the first question that you were referring to is, what's going well? The second one is, what's not? The third one is, where are you stuck? And the fourth one is, what needs to change? And as a consultant, he shared that if he was meeting with you for a day, he'd spend the whole morning on question one. Max, what's wow. going well? And as you would share, he'd say, wow, and you know, tell me more about that. You know, what else? How did you figure that out? Wow, wow, wow. And 
And so he's exploring all these things that are going right so that when he moves to the second question, what's well, not, you're feeling really safe. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're feeling like as he's asking what's going well and you're giving all these answers, you're getting the feeling that he must think you're one of the most brilliant leaders he's ever met with. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's so true. In the afternoon when he says, might there be anything that's not going well? You're really comfortable saying, well, there's a couple of things. But he said, if he started with that question, it'd be like he's, you know, asking you to get undressed in, with a stranger. Yeah. And, you know, we, it's like, yeah, you don't want most, that. Yeah. Yeah, most people don't want to, you know, start with saying what's not going well because it makes them look like they're a loser. <laughs> well, I was on another podcast. And I, with uh, Tom Ziegler, oh, Zig wow. Ziegler's son, who's now president of Ziegler. And I was sharing these four questions. And right at this point, Tom uh, interrupted me. I mean, very politely. He said, Bob, I'm a bit of a, a brain nerd. I've studied brain science. Can I tell you why that first question is so brilliant? And I said, Tom, it's your podcast. You can. Yeah, share please. Like, do whatever you want, right? Yes. He said, well, when the brain is processing positive things, positive endorphins are firing. And he said, that is the ideal place in which to solve problems. He said, if you start with everything that's going wrong, you have all these negative feelings. And that's not an ideal place for a team to solve problems in. And I said, wow, wow. Yeah, that makes so, so much sense. I love yeah. that. And, you know, those four questions, I really do encourage leaders. I think sometimes, you know, we're looking at the clock and thinking we only have an hour meeting here today and we've got a major problem. And so we jump right in and we don't know that when we're doing that time and time again, our team feels like they're losers. And taking the time to say what's going well and letting them rehearse that and doing some high fives and some appreciations uh, and then saying, you know, wow, we, we have so much here to be grateful for. Um, there is one area we need to work on so that we can excel still more. And then you address that, you'll get far better results. Wow, I, I love that. And I have to say, like, I'm a huge fan of kind of like, I don't know if you're familiar with Tony Robbins, but peak state, right? Yeah. Like getting into the right emotional state of like feeling that passion, that excitement, the gratitude, because all of a sudden you're going to make very different decisions than if you're bored, oh. you're frustrated, you're tired, you're anxious, whatever it is, right? And so first getting yourself in a peak state by asking like, what's going right? Like, what's amazing in this company, in my life, whatever? I love that. Um, I shared earlier with you, Max, that, that I'm a a dad of four and now a grandpa of six. Very busy, probably. And, uh, you know, in parenting, and this is a bit of a confession, uh, there are times where my son brings home a report card and his marks are not as good as I would like. And, and of course, I immediately jump to the lowest grade and say, <laughs> what's going on here? Why are you not doing better? And uh, I've realized later, wow, there's a much better way to parent and that is to start with what's going well and um and, and my son for example great kid now a great man um i mean he was not doing drugs he was not doing alcohol he, he was you know not getting in trouble at school uh, a great a great kid very proud of him and um and I found it worked far better for me to start with commending him for all the good things. And, um, and, you know, and then we could address an area of concern, but it was in the context of his name is Bill. Bill, I'm so proud. So appreciate you're such a great son. Um, and, um, you know, then we could talk about that one area. So you don't, I'm sharing this for any parent, mom or dad, uh, this principle can work there. It can work on any committee you're a part of. It can work on any team. It can work with your coworkers. It can even work for yourself to stop and think in my life, what's going well? Because so often, Max, when we jump to a problem, in fact, you know, earlier you asked about leaders that impacted me. I talked about my lifelong mentor, Bob Beal. And, uh, 
he talks about emotional balance. So often there's one area in our life that's going bad and we can get emotionally into all of life is terrible. <laughs> and, and he likes to go back and say, how's the family doing? Oh, they're doing fine. <laughs> and how's your health? Oh, health is good. And, you know, he'll go through a number of areas. Oh, so it appears out of all the really uh, major issues of life, you know, you got nine or 10 going really well. There's just one here that is some of concern. In other words, your whole life isn't going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> yeah, but that's how we think oftentimes, right? Right. <laughs> No, I, lo I love that. I mean, it's really this, this brain's negativity bias, right? Where we're always focused on the one thing that is negative. Even if like you had five amazing conversations, just things happening in the day, there's one person cutting you off in traffic. We're going to be pissed all day, right? Yes. So I, I love I would love what you're saying of really focusing on what what's actually going right in my life, right? Because all of us have areas where things are going well, whether it's your health, your family, your job, at least one area everyone's going to find that like, that's great. Yep. Love that. So, um, Bob, one of the problems for many people is uh, small talk and specifically like making connections meaningful. And so getting over this, like, you know, talking about the weather, talking about sports, how can we make sure what kind of questions can we ask to actually make our connections more meaningful? Um, you know, Max, one of the benefits of questions is when we ask somebody a question, they're likely to give us an answer. <laughs> we're, we're kind of even trained as small children. You know, your your grandma just asked you a question, Max. You need to answer it uh, kind of thing. And so when you ask people questions, uh, they generally are very willing to answer. And, of course, um, uh, another part of asking questions, if you're going to ask a question, you then have to listen. But, um, you know, for small talk, sometimes we need we, we need some small talk to uh, to break the ice. We're, we're of course, yeah. yeah, we're let's say we go to a conference and we see somebody we don't know at all across the room. And so you walk over, stick out your hand, you know, hello, my name's Bob. And uh, you get their name. And, uh, you know, what brought you to the conference? Um, and. Um, you know, tell, tell, love to hear your story. One of my favorite questions is asking people to share their story. Now, that might come as the second, third question. I don't walk up to a stranger and say, hey, please tell me your story. Yeah. But I find that you can get there rather quickly. You know, Max, what, what brought you to the conference? Um, and, uh, you know, Max begins to share. And, uh, you know, have you come a long ways or or uh, do you live in this area? Oh, you know, and they share that. Wow. Wow, Max, I'd love to hear your story. And um, and then you listen and people will begin to share their story. And um, one of the things I, I share in my book uh, that I've learned and the reason I love asking the please tell me your story question is I used to probably ask, tell me about your job. And generally that can be a great question but if they just got laid off then that's year, awkward <laughs> and and i used to say tell me about your family and again generally a good question but if they're going through a divorce it's awkward or if they've got a son or a daughter that's in real trouble of some kind but when you say please tell me your story it lets them go wherever they want and, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be an investigative reporter mm -hmm. to ask things that would be embarrassing to them. That's not the point. And uh, in a way they go. And um, now my, my second question, here's another concept, Max, asking the second question. And I think we miss this. So or at least I missed it for a long time. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well. Max, uh, let me uh, experiment with you just a little bit here. Um, there's also a concept of, of hijacking the conversation that many times we're tempted to do. So, uh, Max, uh, where did you go on your last vacation? That was probably to Italy. Wow. Now, I could hijack the conversation by saying, wow, let me tell you about all the times I went to Italy. <laughs> okay. Way to go over and everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, but I've just taken the conversation and made it about me. Wow. Italy. Where in Italy did you go? 
and, and I let you talk and like, well, how did you discover that place? Now, maybe you went to Rome. It, you know, it's like, okay, I know how you discovered it. But what did you enjoy most about Rome? And you start sharing about, you know, whatever. Wow, the Colosseum. Tell me more about that. And in other words, you use part of their answer to ask the next question. And uh, it's and, and get away from the temptation to hijack the conversation to tell Max everything you know about Rome. <laughs> you know, later Max in the conversation may say, well, Bob, have you ever been there? And, and of course you can give some answer to that. But uh, the second question is always take something they've shared and go deeper with them by asking the second question that leads to the third question, the fourth question. And, and of course you wanna be sensitive. This is not an interrogation. This is a, a friendly conversation. But um, I find those things avoid small talk. I, I, I have one more kind of favorite question uh, that relates also, um, it's kind of another version of please tell me your story. And that is to ask someone, could you please uh, share with me, what would you think are the three or four events that have most shaped your life? Wow, that's an interesting one. And I find that most people have never heard that question but if you will give them 10 15 seconds of silence you're going to be amazed at their answers i, I asked that of one friend and uh, gosh he is director of training for a major fortune 100 corporation wow and he's been a friend for about 10 years i asked him that question thinking i won't hear anything i don't already know and he said, well, Bob, I have not shared this with many people, but um, I was training for the Olympics as a runner and I got a, a summer job working in a warehouse. And that first week, a major piece of equipment fell on me. Oh no. And he said, I was uh, in and out of hospitals, orthopedic surgery, for a year and and he said i still live with pain every day most people don't know it because i don't talk about it and it was like wow wow here was somebody I knew for 10 years but i had never heard that uh, the, and i'm amazed because if you met him he seems high energy you would never know that he's actually experiencing physical pain and, um, and, and I found Max by asking that one question, it was like, we had a great relationship, but the relationship went deeper in like 10 minutes. Oh, I believe that. I believe yeah. that. So, um, those are some things I, I asked to, uh, start with small talk. You might say one or two questions, but then Max, I'd love to hear, what would you say are the three or four events that most shaped your life? Or I'd love to hear your story. Or wherever they've answered, ask the second question, the third question, the fourth question. Well, I love those to really take the conversations deeper. So thank you for that. Um, now, Bob, one of the things, probably the, the leadership team that I'm most interested in is personal leadership. So how we manage our own self-talk, how we kind of make decisions, what we focus our direction on all day long. And so I have this journal every morning where I kind of write down like what I'm grateful for, what I want to accomplish today, like how do I want to feel, right? What are the kind of emotions? How do I want to show up? Do you have any other questions or ideas or suggestions for how we can improve our self-leadership? Well, Max, I, I want to start with just affirming you. What it sounds like is that every morning you ask yourself four, five, six questions. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, so you are, that's a great example of you are actually leading yourself every day with questions. Um, uh, Max, you could actually use those questions with your staff. Mm -hmm. In other words, others that you lead. Um, you know, maybe you're asking those weekly in a, in a staff meeting, but, it, but again, those are just great questions. And, and I affirm that. Awesome. That Thank we you. ask ourselves basic questions for the day. And um, 
one of uh, one of my reminders every morning, uh, Max, as you may have picked up in, in my book, I'm a follower of Jesus and um, and I, I read the scriptures and, and love them. And uh, uh, there's so many uh, great scriptures, but one of them is that man plans his way, but God orders our footsteps. And one of my prayers and questions that I kind of focus every day on is uh, who might be crossing my path today that I that I dare not miss mm-hmm. and, I, and I don't want to wow. say that that every day yep I, I I see them but I kind of approach every day with I want some margin so that the people that cross my path and and sometimes Max it's just a compliment it's just a kind word to a cashier it's um, it's a kind word to uh, a waiter or waitress, but uh, you know, other times they're more significant conversations, and and to take the time to inquire, to listen, and um, at any rate, that's one of the self leadership things that I do, is and and you know, I'm suggesting I shared where I got it from, but. Uh, one does not need to be a follower of Christ to have just awareness that there's people that come across our paths. And, um, and if we'll have eyes to see, um, we'll be able to do something to encourage them, uh, bless them. Uh, and some of those are just brief encounters and done, but others open up into conversations. And, and Max, I'm sure you can tell stories like this too, um there become some dear lifelong friends and it started with that kind of random like one of my dear friends uh we were in line at starbucks together Uh, (laughs) another dear friend um we got on in the u.s there's an airline called southwest airlines where you don't get a seat in advance you get a number and uh, you go stand in line and you board according to those numbers. Well, I walk up and, and uh, next to me is a uh, great person. Uh, they smile. They say hello. I say hello. And, and we start a conversation. We end up sitting together, flying from Dallas to Orlando. And uh, today it's one of my best friends. I love but that. Yeah. All because of starting with small talk and then following that conversation. Now, I don't want to suggest every one of those ends that way, but I'm blessed, amused, and thankful to think back just saying hi and uh, and starting with small talk has resulted in some incredible friendships that I wouldn't have otherwise if I'd been silent. Oh, I absolutely agree. Actually, one of my best friends, Marco from Italy, I met him in the laundry room, right? We're both doing laundry and we're just like talking in between. Yeah. And so it's just like those those encounters. And it sounds like you what you're really talking about is opening yourself up for the possibility that things are going to happen. They're going to be amazing, right? So being aware of like situations and just being thoughtful and mindful, right? Of like any day something amazing can happen. Max, meeting you is one of those amazing things for me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. So, Bob, what was one of the biggest challenges throughout your life, and how did you overcome that? Hmm. You know, Max, there's there's been um, there's been many many challenges. Um, and, you know, I'm going to focus on one right now. That's really a part of our discussion. Um, if you're a leader who thinks that the leader not only needs to set direction, but a leader needs to know everything when you're confronted with things where you really don't know, you are tempted to just make it up. (laughs) And, um, I don't know that this actually borders on that. Uh, It does a bit, but um, we were sending a huge humanitarian team, the advanced team to Russia. And um, 
and we were doing something there that uh, it was a new outreach. I won't go into details, but we'd never done before. And uh, I sat at my desk in Texas and wrote an entire manual on what this advanced team needed to do. And uh, they got over there and it was a disaster because um, um, I, I forget the general who says any battle plan looks great until the battle starts. <laughs> And then there's chaos. Mm -hmm. And the plan kind of assumed just everything would go well. It had no uh, no part of that plan uh, considered things not going well. And it, there was no contingencies on what if, what if, what if. And um, that was one of my most painful leadership experiences because, in essence, I had sent men and women into battle ill-prepared. Now, we actually had two teams. One was in Moscow and one was in St. Petersburg. And the St. Petersburg team was being led by a uh, retired army colonel. And so thankfully, I'm so thankful for him. Uh, when it didn't go well, he did what he would have done as a military leader. And that is kind of like in a battle when it doesn't work this way and now the the battlefield looks different you know he asked himself he actually led with questions he asked himself and his team hey this isn't going like bob thought it would what should we do <laughs> and they figured it out and so they were and, able to adapt and, and change Yeah, they were adapt mm -hmm. and figured it out the other team was stuck oh. because it was like they were looking to me and i wasn't there I was still back in Texas. So um, I would actually say that, um, well, the amazing thing, kind of tell the rest of the story, is is when the volunteers arrived, uh, by God's grace and some great uh, leadership, not mine, but some others who stepped in, um, they got ahead of the problem by about 24 hours. They couldn't tell you what was going to happen two days from now, but today they figured out how to attack tomorrow. And tomorrow they figured out how to attack the next day. Yeah, and and oftentimes it's all in need, right? Yeah, we actually uh, pulled it off. But the painful part, again, was being directive. And if I had trained them what the leader in St. Petersburg did, it was natural to him. But if we'd actually trained them to say, when you get there, it may be completely different. It may not work out the way we're thinking. And as a team, you're gonna to have to pull together and say, okay, wh what do we think we ought to do now? In light of this, how, should, how might we go forward? And so um, a painful lesson in the teller assumes too much, assumes too much knowledge and doesn't take in to consideration it may not go like you think wow well thank you so much for sharing that i think that's such a key point in, in life in general right really any area of your life that things sometimes you're going to plan things you're going to set these goals and then life happens right and things are going to happen differently and so it's always uh important to be able to adapt and then change direction and kind of view of course and and still take action still stay positive and make the most out of it so thank you for sharing that so, Bob, if you could meet anyone from history, whether living or dead, who would it be and what would you say to them? Uh, well, I know you know a lot of great leaders, so yes. is there anyone yes. that comes to mind? Um, well, one, one I'd love to meet would be Benjamin Franklin. And the reason I've, I've named him is he uh, had a... Um, a weekly club. And if you were to be part of the club, uh, you had to come to the club with answers to, and I don't have these at the tip of my tongue, but it was like 10 questions that they, that every week when you met and, and there were questions related to, and you can Google for these. And I did a blog post about this. I just don't have it memorized, but, um, you know, what did you accomplish this past week? Uh, 
what are you wanting to accomplish? Uh, what new things are you learning? And wow. uh, and so uh, on one hand, you know, the, the, the questions, the brilliance, and here's something, Max, about great questions. Many times they're really simple. The, the answers become brilliant, but but the questions are not long, run on, complex questions. You know, earlier when I said, "What do you think about?" Not a not a complex question, but it works. Uh, when you say, "Tell me your story," not a complex question. When we talked about, um, you know, what's going well, what's not, where are you stuck, what needs to change simple questions but they they really really work and so um that'd be my answer there max yes yeah, so really finding those simple but effective questions i, I love that and benjamin franklin that, that sounds really interesting yeah. i'll definitely i definitely look up that post and also put it put it in the description and on my blog so you know, another leader that um as a follower of jesus i actually know i will meet him in eternity and that's <laughs> And, and I say to people, um, even if they're not a follower of Jesus, even if they're not a religious person whatsoever, wouldn't it be wise to see what you might learn from one of the greatest communicators of all of history? And when you study Jesus as a communicator, you see that he majored on two things. He told great stories and he asked great questions. And uh, I've actually compiled in a second book, and the title of it is 339 Questions Jesus Asked. If you go through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just pull out the questions, it turns out there's 339 of them. And if um, in looking at those, uh, there are so many things one can learn, but it's, it's like um, Jesus being God never asked a question he didn't know the answer to. Now, I ask a lot of questions, Max, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> but if we assume he knew all the answers, why did he ask the questions? And the only conclusion would be that he understood that if you're wanting to actually uh, make a difference in people's lives, that um, asking them questions that allow them to come to their own conclusions, asking them questions that build relationships, uh, is a much better way to relate to people than to just be a teller. And so uh, at any rate, Jesus is certainly another person I long to meet. And, um, and again, the list, the list can be, uh, uh, you know, there's many times I'm reading things of, of people of history and I hear the questions they ask and it's like, wow. I'd love, I'd love to know how they came up with that question. I'd love to know where they learned that question. Yeah, oh, I agree. I mean, if, even if you think back, like even 2,000 years ago to like the Stoic philosophers, things like that, Marcus Aurelius, the book, I don't know if you know, it, Meditations, it's so incredible how like they were thinking about these same ideas 2,000 years ago, ago, right? Like Aristotle, yeah. like talking about habits and stuff. It's truly amazing, I think, like what we can learn from history. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we talk about Socrates when it comes to asking questions yeah. and um, and having a classroom situation where he asks questions rather than just lecture. And, um, you know, that, that leads me on another rabbit trail, and, and that is um, our, our current education system. I, I don't know about the one in Germany, but uh, oh, I know it's much better, luckily. <laughs> well, I know the one in the U.S., and someone said that the average uh, like five-year-old asks over 200 questions a day <laughs> the average college graduate only asks 20. oh i believe that and um and what happens with that five-year-old is they start school and they're asking lots of questions and the teacher says max it's my job to ask the questions. It's your job to give the answers. Well, they hear that over and over and over, and soon they quit asking questions. And um, by the time they graduate from college, they're not asking very many. Now, there's a group in the U.S., uh, a, a great, well, a group, an organization that is actually uh, teaching teachers on how to 
teach students to ask questions. And I think it's an incredible skill for uh, all people, but imagine starting with students in, in grade school to train them, encourage them, help them learn to ask questions and for them to understand the value. Obviously, I didn't understand it. Yeah, so you wish you know. had been in that class, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, lo I love that. It's really about like kind of giving people this curiosity back, right? That oftentimes, I think we learn to forget in school because it's just, we're just taught to kind of sit still and like just listen to whatever the teacher is saying. But, but really yeah. find that curiosity again, no matter what age you are, no matter what you do, I think it's so important. So I, I love that. Well, there's one group, I think they're called the Right Question Institute. And kind of when they started, uh, as I read the story, there was a group of students that had to go to summer school. Now in the US, if you have to go to summer school, when they came to class, they all looked around and said, okay, we're all the dummies. <laughs> because only students who'd failed during the year had to go to summer school. And uh, the teacher came in and said, we're gonna do something really different. And that is, you all are going to ask the questions this summer and, and not me. And it was like, what? And uh, I'll just say, let's say, just say, for example, if the class was geography and, um, and the country they wanted to study was Germany, rather than the teacher lecture on all the facts about Germany, instead, the students, the first thing, we're going to study Germany, the first thing is, we need to come up with 50 questions about Germany. We're going to write them and put them on posters all around the classroom. And so the students came up with the questions. Then they had the students go up and mark which questions they thought would be the best ones to study. And so they then, out of the 50, came to the top 10. Then students in groups of three or four were assigned to go find the answers to each of those 10 questions. Each you know, group had one question. And then they shared with each other what they discovered. Well, at the end of the summer in that class, those students tested out all with high marks. <laughs> oh, wow. And it was like, wow. And so that school began to use this method with all students, not just those who had failed. <laughs> and found that it was revolutionary. And, uh, and I just love, you know, the fact is when you ask people questions, the brain becomes engaged. And uh, as they got involved in their own learning, um, they learned. Yeah, and, all of a sudden you take like ownership of that idea, right? All of a sudden you begin to care about it, to engage with that. So I love this idea of just, just coming up with your own questions really that you're actually curious about. And, um, and again, just a school system that is training, understands the value of training kids and how to ask questions. I mean, think about even your education, Max. When I think about my education, I had not one class from the time I started school to the time I graduated from the university that was about learning to ask better questions. <laughs> I actually had one. I had, I had an interview in class. That, that was really amazing. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, Bob, do you have a favorite mantra or quote that you live your life by that you keep repeating to yourself that helps you? Mm. You know, it's, it's not quite a mantra, you know, mantras kind of are like clever, <laughs> clever sayings. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the name of my blog, Leading with Questions, has really become, the concept has really become my mantra, and that is to uh, focus every relationship, every leadership situation on asking questions rather than telling people what to do. Uh, so, um, you know, that, and, and yeah, Max, it's like I stumbled into this. This has not come originally. Um, you know, I find this book, I read it. It's a page turner, Leading with Questions by Dr. Michael Marquardt. And, uh, but that concept now is the concept that I lead with. And it's the concept that uh, 
I mean, every meeting, uh, I think of, uh, I, I did a recent blog post uh, related to agenda, meeting agendas. Well, for many, many years, I would just list topics. And reading Michael Marquardt's book, I saw, oh, wait, there's a better concept, and that is don't just list topic. For each topic, create a question. Because if we go to a meeting and we see just a list of topics, we're not sure where's, what's the leader want. Is this just a report, an update? Um, I don't really know. Yeah, we're going to talk about this, but I don't know what the goal is. As soon as we turn that agenda item to a question, now everyone understands what the goal is. The goal is to answer the question, but if the question's clear, okay, now I know what we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, so it's just, again, this whole concept of, of leading with questions. When when in, uh, for me, in a church situation, I'm teaching, uh, so many are used to what I would call uh, preaching. In other words, hearing a message in which uh, the pastor leader is just telling. They may ask questions, but they're rhetorical. And, and I'll go in and immediately put people into small groups and uh, even in a large situation and say, hey, I want you to take five minutes to uh, discuss this question. And so, because I know at the end of the day, people leave with what they said. They remember what they said, not what I said. <laughs> That's such an important concept, I think, really leading with questions. Um, that was really, I mean, the general theme here. So I love that. Now, about my final question, what does mental mastery mean to you? Hmm. Well, Max, I, I know it's a concept that you can define very quickly and clearly. Um, but, um, but to me, it is um, really understanding how does the brain work? And it's a bit like, um, I'm sure this perhaps dumbs it down, but I'm trying to think of a simple word picture kind of thing. And that is um, take a computer program, Probably the designer of that program, the, per the person who programmed it, who wrote the code, may best understand how to leverage that program. And so when I think of, of uh, mastering um, the mind, it's like, okay, having to understand how it works, how, how to leverage it. And, um, and, for me, I, I realized that Jesus was actually involved in creation. He helped create the whole being, the brain, the heart, the will, the mind, the emotion, all of it. And, and again, you don't have to be a follower of Christ to kind of follow my logic here. But he designed it all. And then he was here. He spent half of his time asking questions and the other half telling great stories and what's fascinating to me on both is that he was leveraging the way in which the brain is created. It's an amazing thing, Max, that when we hear a great story, we don't have to say, oh, let me write this down. Let me try to memorize it. Let me really study. Like, you know, if we were studying geography or history and the teacher gave us a whole bunch of random facts, we had to really study to kind of memorize that so we could regurgitate it on a test. But when somebody tells us a great story, a week later, if it comes up, we can retell the story almost verbatim. Oh, for sure. Hmm. It just sticks in our mind. And then the second thing is that he asked all those questions. And so for me, um, give me the name again. You said it's the title. Mental Mastery. Yes. To me, it's really learn to tell great stories and ask great questions so that you can engage the minds of others that you come in contact with. Um, and, you know, Max, I'm sure there's other things you can say. I'm not suggesting I've given the complete answer. Oh, no, I love that. I love that way of looking at it. Yeah, I've, I've added to the pile of great concept there. Oh, for sure. If you'll learn to tell great stories, and understand people remember stories. They don't remember facts and figures, but tell great stories. 
and then ask great questions. And, and again, not to trap people, but like the question is that golden key that unlocks hearts and minds, you ask great questions that unlocks things for them. And, you know, they end up thanking you for the time because it's like, wow, I've never thought of this before, but it was their thought. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you to everyone who tuned in to today's episode of Mental Mastery. Tune in daily for new episodes on how you can achieve mental mastery and live a happy and successful life. And if you would like a little extra push, head over to my website maxweigand.com for a free ebook on mastering self-discipline and willpower. There, you can also sign up for my one-on-one -on -one habit coaching program where I help you master your habits and achieve your goals. Also, if you like this interview, feel free to rate and review the show. Until next time.